Kia ora iti iwi. Welcome to our Wednesday webinars throughout February 2021. These hour long presentations are a way for us to get you ready for Involve Reunion 2021 here in Te Atara. The Involve Conference provides connection, networking and professional development for those that care about amplifying young people's mana. Please introduce yourself in the chat and we will be using the Q&A throughout the presentation as well. We'll be starting shortly. Kia ora ite whānau, kia ora koutou, ko Shannon aho, kei aratahi takmahi. Uh, welcome to our Involve webs on WINS. Um, just a quick note that the following presentation will talk about self-harm or self-injury um, and may have other distressing content. Um, our presenter is very experienced in holding that space. But just a reminder, and if you could check in with yourself, check out if you need to, and check in with your support networks if anything continues to impact you. I'm going to start with a karakia. If you know the karakia, please join. Ka inoi tato. Ko ranganui kei runga. Ko papatuanuku kei raro. Ko natangata kei wainanui. Tihei. Order. Here we go. Um, Michael, if you could turn on your video and unmute yourself, uh, I'd like to just give you a mini uh, mini intro, which is I'm excited to hear from you as a super, you're a super presenter in my eyes. Um, and you no work, pressure then. No, <laughs> no, no pressure. pressure. Yeah. And you work for our friends at the Collaborative mm. down in Ototahi. Um, I've heard really cool things about how engaging you are. And I know it's a webinar session, so there is like absolutely no pressure in, in living up to your on stage presence. But um, I can't wait. I'm going to ask you to actually introduce yourself more and maybe a little bit more about the, the content of your presentation. And then I'm going to turn off my vid and sit back and listen. So thank you so much, Michael. Right. Good morning, everyone. Right, can I just check that my uh, screen is sharing? Ooh, there we are, yes, that's working, great. Uh, yes, so um, I am Michael Hempseed. Now, I know one of the things that everyone wants to know is what is the deal with your last name? Uh, for those of you that don't know, Hempseed is somewhat associated with marijuana. Uh, this genuinely is my last name, this is not a joke. If you want to know where this came from, this came from hemp rope in Scotland that they used to use on ships, not the stuff they smoke, just in case there was any doubt. Um, so basically what I do is I travel all over New Zealand. If you look in the bottom right hand corner there, I wrote a book on suicide prevention and a big aspect of that is self-harm. I travel all over New Zealand giving evidence-based talks on this. But before I got into this line of work, I had a different goal in life. Um, I always wanted to have my own ready lawn company, and I was going to call it Hemp Seeds Grass. Uh, I also love traveling. We don't have a global pandemic. Uh, from top left to bottom right, we've got China, Morocco, uh, Pisa, Rome. In the bottom left there, that is the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. So yes, I now glow in the dark. Uh, Brazil and Cambodia. So I've been to a few interesting places around the world. Okay, let's get right into this. Um, so when we talk about self-harm, we've all probably accidentally injured ourselves. You know, we've tripped over the cat, fallen down the stairs. Probably at some point, all of us have done that. However, when we talk about self-harm, we're not talking about an accidental injury. We're talking about someone that um, deliberately hurts themselves. And often we associate the word cutting with self-harm. And certainly cutting is a common form of it, but it can also include deliberately burning yourself, um, drinking poison without the intention to end your life. And there's also um, hair pulling and uh, skin picking. But I also think there's possibly other forms of self-harm that we don't consider, such as um, you know, people punching walls and things like that. I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the DSM-5. This is the book that clinicians use to diagnose mental illnesses. And you might be surprised to learn that self-harm is not actually considered um, a diagnosis in and of itself. And I hope it stays that way. It is seen as a symptom of something rather than a mental illness in and of itself. 
I'd also like to point out that um, at the back of the DSM, they include conditions for further study, and um, they've included what we call non-suicidal self-injury. That's the technical name for this, at the back there to be studied further. But at the moment, it's considered a symptom of something, and I hope it stays that way. Um, just a quick note, um, what's called trichotillomania and ducotillomania, skin picking and hair pulling, they are both considered separate um, diagnoses. So a lot of people want to know, well, um, how serious is self-harm? Well, all self-harm is serious, but there are forms of it that are more or less serious. Unfortunately, today, a lot of people have heard about this, and they may hear about this and say, I'll try it once or twice. That is at the less serious end. Then, unfortunately, some people find that it actually is quite helpful, and they use it again and again. Then some people find this becomes addictive. And then the most serious form of this is if it's the result of schizophrenia, um, where perhaps people see things that aren't there, they hear voices that aren't there, and maybe they're trying to self-harm because they think they've got animals under their skin. Uh, that is the most serious form of self-harm, and we'll look at that a little bit later. So um, these are the num latest numbers we have. Um, the Youth 19 results haven't been released yet, so as soon as they are, I'll add those. Um, but basically, a couple of things to note. We think that roughly about one in three young people in New Zealand have self-harmed, and that is a staggering number. You know, it should be one or two percent. This should be rare. Um, the fact that it's roughly one in three is an absolute disaster. It's also worth noting that um, women report twice as much self-harm as men do. Um, there's no um, non-binary numbers, unfortunately. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of things that men do that aren't noticed, such as, you know, punching walls, getting into fights they can't win. But universally, um, women have always reported twice as much mental illness as men. And we think that isn't just better reporting. We think that that genuinely does seem to be that women do seem to experience this at twice the rate of men. So a lot of people want to know, well, what's the difference between self-harm and suicide? Well, generally speaking, self-harm is a coping mechanism. So someone that's self-harming is usually not trying to end their lives. They might do this to relieve stress, to feel something, um, and sometimes even to punish themselves. I'll go into this in more detail in a minute. And often suicide is wanting to end the pain or escape the situation. So we're going to look at some of the main reasons why people self-harm now. The first one is that people say it feels good. Now, most people with a perfect life don't start spontaneously self-harming. Often there has to be some negative emotions. And often if people feel really sad, when they self-harm, they get a hit of adrenaline and they feel good for a short time. However, the problem is that good feeling doesn't last long at all. It might last 10 or 15 seconds. And so one of the problems is that if you were feeling really down and you did something to try and make yourself feel better, and you, overall you end up feeling worse, some people may do it again and again, and this can lead to an addiction. The other problem with this is um, people can build up what's called tolerance to this, and they cause themselves deeper and deeper and more painful injuries. It's interesting to know how young people often view themselves if they have self-harmed. Um, someone said this to me, um, at the time it felt really good, but afterwards I felt really down and depressed. I kept thinking, what kind of a freak would do this to themselves? So often young people are harsher on themselves than we could be. They don't need punishment. They need help and support. Another key reason why people look at this is relief and escapism. Just about everyone says that if you had the choice of having intense physical pain or intense mental pain, most people would choose intense physical pain. And so if people have got a lot of bad thoughts or emotions in their head, sometimes they'll cause themselves a lot of physical pain and it takes their mind off what has happened. And this one's slightly complicated, to present a physical manifestation of an invisible pain. And one of the problems with mental illness is we can't often see it, but people know they're experiencing this deep emotional turmoil and sometimes they self-harm to try and show other people what they're going through. They try and explain, this is the pain that I am in. This is how much it hurts. This surprises a lot of people, but some young people actually report self-harming to avoid dying by suicide. And that sounds really quite surprising. But what do you think happens if lots of bad thoughts build up and build up and build up, and there's no way to stop them? 
well then that can turn into suicide. So some people self-harm to actually try and relieve that pressure and to stop it building up to suicide. So a lot of adults assume that a self-harm attempt is always a suicide attempt, but in some cases it's the opposite and they're actually trying to avoid suicide. This is probably the one we're most familiar with. Um, some young people report that um, they self-harm to feel something. It's really important to know that if depression becomes really advanced, people don't report feeling sadness, they often report feeling numbness or no emotions at all. And some people say they will self-harm to try and feel something. And they say, I know it wasn't a good thing to do, but when I felt that pain, I felt a little bit human again. Um, as a warning sign, if you ever know a young person is self-harming and they feel no pain at all, that is often a sign that can turn to suicide. That person needs immediate attention. Um, the other one is psychosis. So as I mentioned before, some people have delusional or irrational thoughts and um, they can seriously injure themselves. A classic example of this is the artist Vincent van Gogh. Um, it's famously known that he cut off his ear and it was thought that that was the result of a psychotic episode. We need to be very clear of how dangerous psychosis can be. Psychosis is a medical emergency, and if someone is in this state, they need immediate medical attention. Just a side note to this, many people look at the classic image of his Starry Night, and they think it's an incredibly powerful image. Some people have suggested that if Van Gogh had schizophrenia, this was actually how he saw the world, with swirling stars like this. It's important to know that sometimes what we think may be a wonderful form of art, in some cases, could actually be an insight into someone that needs urgent help. The most serious form of self-harm in terms of why people do it is self-hatred. If someone is angry at themselves and they self-harm, often this turns into a suicide attempt. You might wonder, well, how do we know why people did this? The only way is to ask them. If you are aware that a young person has been self-harming, you should gently say to them, I've noticed these cuts on your arm, or you told me about the self-harm. I'm not angry, but I am really concerned about you. Can you tell me why you did it? Were you really stressed out? Were you really angry at yourself? Did you want to feel something? And the only way to know is to ask. If you ask and find out why they did it, they can respond appropriately. It is also important to know that sometimes young people will say, I don't know. In many cases, they are not being difficult or defiant. They may genuinely not know what caused this. That is also an important indicator and something to look into further. I now want to go through um, a number of self-harm myths because unfortunately there's quite a few of them out there. The first myth is that it is just young people. Well, in 1987, um, patients in UK hospitals who were in their 60s reported a history of self-harm. So it's really important to know it is not just young people that do this. However, it is estimated that 90% of young people that self-harm do not go on to become chronic self-harmers. That may have something to do with the development of the teenage brain. A lot of people think that if we remove sharp objects, that will stop someone self-harming. Unfortunately, often young people become inventive, and actually it would have been far better if, say, they used a sterile knife. So what we need to try and do is remove the reasons for the self-harm rather than the tools that they use. I must be clear, this does not apply to a suicide attempt. If you think someone is attempting suicide, it is absolutely vital that you remove any tools or items that they are planning to use. We quite often think that suicide and self-harm are different, but there is some crossover. It is estimated that a quarter to a half of all people that die by suicide have a history of self-harm. And Dr. Keith Houghton, a very famous researcher in the UK, found that people that have a history of self-harm are 66 times more likely than the general population to die by suicide. So it is incredibly important that we take all forms of self-harm very seriously. 
This one's uh, somewhat controversial, but um, it used to be thought that so stopping self-harm is always a good idea. There is some research that is coming out of the United States that suggests that, say, if parents give their children very invasive body searches at night, that um, this can actually lead to suicide. Because as I said before, for some people, self-harm is a relief valve. If you take that away, that pressure can build up. So in the short term, self-harm is obviously a lesser evil than suicide. Again, we need to try and teach young people better coping techniques and better ways of managing this rather than just removing the self-harm in and of itself. Another myth is you can tell by the direction of the cuts if people cut one way it's a suicide attempt, if they cut another way it's a self-harm attempt. Um, there's such bad information out there now that often people don't know what they're doing. The only way to know is to ask. A number of uh, youth organisations are worried that if we get this wrong, we'll be liable or we'll be fired. Um, I will talk about limits later, but if you genuinely try and help someone and refer someone to help, um, you're not going to get shut down or in trouble for that. Um, it's really important to know that you know asking about this and referring someone to help is a safe thing to do. Sometimes people think that if we do something and get it wrong, we'll make this worse. Um, I've worked with thousands of young people with severe mental illness over the last few years. And one of the biggest complaints is not that people get it wrong. That does occasionally happen. The biggest complaint is that I told an adult and they didn't do anything. And lastly, the biggest myth around self-harm is that they are just seeking attention. It is worthwhile noting that probably 80 to 90% of people that self-harm do not do this on visible parts of their body. They do it, say, on the inside leg, on their chest, and they actually go out of their way to hide this. So it is important to know many people are doing the opposite of seeking attention. Those that do do it on visible parts of their body might be saying, I need help, but they are not seeking attention or wasting our time. There are numerous studies that have found there are very good reasons why people self-harm. Although people never self-harm, there are good reasons why people do this. The next question is, if someone has self-harmed, do they need medical attention? And people ask, well, how do we know? Uh, this isn't always an easy question to answer. Um, generally speaking, um, if you're on the fence and you think, I'm not sure about this, it's really good to check it out. A couple of signs that someone does need medical attention would be, say, if a wound doesn't stop bleeding, or if you think it's getting infected, those would certainly be signs that you need medical attention. If you are unsure as a youth worker what to do, you can always ring Healthline for advice, but if in doubt, do take someone to a nurse or a doctor to get it checked out. Okay, I'm just going to pause there. That's quite a lot of information. I'm um, just wondering, do we have any questions on any of this so far? And then I want to look at a couple of other reasons why people self-harm. Looks like I've answered everything that everyone could possibly want. Oh, no, we have a question. Okay. Yeah, um, so it's estimated that, um, so I think 66 times more likely. So Keith Houghton found that young people who self-harm are more like, are 66 times more likely than the general population to die by suicide. So that means that self-harm, is a, a history of self-harm is a really high risk factor for suicide. And um, with any of this, I'm happy to send you the PowerPoints later and I believe this session is recorded and it will be available to view. Yeah, um, Shana, excellent point. Um, sometimes they're um, given labels of personality disorders and sometimes they're given the label of being difficult or seeking attention. I think it's really important to understand the reasons um, behind this and behind the actions. The next significant reason that I want to look at is, is a response to trauma. We know that New Zealand does seem to have a high rate of domestic violence. We know that an estimated one in three um, women and probably one in six men will be sexually abused before the age of 18. So unfortunately in New Zealand, we have high rates of trauma 
add on to that the earthquakes in Christchurch and the mosque shootings and the global pandemic we are in, and this is going to be something that affects many people. So one of the things that um, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, we'll talk about him a little bit later, um, has found that a lot of people get addicted to trauma. And you'd assume that, say, if someone was in a domestic violence situation, as soon as you get them out of it, then um, they'd stay out of it and they'd never go back to the person again. However, what we have found is that often people in domestic violence situations, they often go back to the person or they get themselves into another. The technical name for this is the repetition compulsion. And often people feel safe in stressful environments because it's what they know. Um, also, when we um, become highly stressed, we get a lot of endorphins, which make us feel good. But when we calm down, we get a lot of soothing chemicals. And sometimes the way that people say they calm down is through going through trauma again and again. For some people, I believe this is a key reason why they self-harm. They are not being difficult, seeking attention or causing trouble. They are addicted to trauma. At the end of this webinar, I will talk about ways to treat this. And some people um, relive the trauma over and over again in their mind. Um, it's a somewhat controversial thing um, in psychology. And some people say, well, doesn't this blame the victim? I say, no, no. Whoever the perpetrator was, we must put the full blame on them. But it's really important to know that sometimes people go through these cycles of trauma. So if they, they do have a history of domestic violence, they may self-harm as a way to relive that. Another form of trauma which is not so widely known about is what we call vicarious or secondary trauma. There was an interesting study conducted for people that were either there on the day of the Boston bombing or people that watched it on TV. They asked people that were there, how do you feel? And they asked people that watched it on TV, how do they feel? The people that watched it on TV reported higher levels of distress than people that were actually there. It is thought that if something happens to you firsthand, it is easier, not easy, but easier to process. Whereas if you watch something on TV, you are often watching helplessly on the sidelines. Also, if you watch something on TV, you tend to see it from every angle. Many people say that New Zealand is okay with the global pandemic. We shouldn't have stressed or upset young people. And yet, if we consider the impact of vicarious trauma, that we have all watched what has been happening overseas, potentially, um, we do have a lot of traumatized young people. One important thing to know about trauma is we often tell people the way to deal with this is to talk about it. One of the most significant findings from trauma research is that there is a part of the brain called Broca's area. This is the speech and language part of the brain. We have found that if someone has experienced significant trauma, this part of the brain does not work so well. So if the speech and language part of the brain does not work so well, that means that they cannot always talk about this. So I'll look at some um, treatments for trauma that do not involve talking, but it's very important to know that sometimes people can't talk about this. Again, we often think that people that can't talk about this are being difficult or defiant, but actually there's a lot more to it than that. So I mentioned Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Um, he is, in my opinion, one of the world's leading experts on trauma. And I encourage every youth worker, no matter what field you are in, to learn more about this. And um, this is something that we are seeing more and more of. So um, if you, he's written an incredible book called The Body Keeps the Score. I cannot recommend this enough. And there are parts of it that um, are a bit difficult to read and it takes a bit of time. But, you know, learning sometimes isn't always easy and sometimes we've got to um, persevere through things. Um, I know I'm presenting this material fairly smoothly today, but sometimes I read over things I think, didn't understand a word of that. You have to sit down and slowly go over it. Um, if you're not so good at reading, this is available as an audio book. And he's also done a 140 minute talk that's available on YouTube. And here's the link. If you go to my website, beingatruehero.com, make sure we've got this on the, yep. Yeah. Um, if you go to the resources tab, um, I've got a whole section there on lots of videos and books on trauma. 
So as I said, I encourage all youth workers, no matter what um, area they're working in, no matter what their experience, learn a little bit more about trauma. Um, as I said, we're seeing high numbers of young people that are showing significant signs of trauma, and we need every youth worker in the country to be aware of this. The next point that I want, oh, sorry, have we got a question? Hold on. Um, Uh, yeah, um, really good question here. Um, what's the NZ um, literature um, on youth self-harm and suicide like? Um, so there's the Youth 19 study, which is part of the Youth 2000 study, uh, which has, we've asked, I think, about 8,500 young people every few years various questions. Um, some of the results of that have been released. Um, one of the key findings that in the last decade, rates of mental illness have doubled in young people. Um, the self-harm findings, as far as I'm aware, have not been released, um, but I've heard from the researchers that, um, that they again seem to think that one in three young people self-harm. Um, we seem to have a very high rate of suicide, uh, so of self-harm in New Zealand. It's thought it's roughly two and a half times that of the UK. Um, and we do unfortunately have the highest um, youth suicide rate in the, in the OECD. So one of the big problems is that um, with um, suicide and self-harm, there's what we call the contagion effect. There's a really interesting book written by Daniel D. Kravitz talking about how in one community when there was a suicide, another one followed and another one and another one followed. And unfortunately, it's really important to be aware that with self-harm as well, when one person starts doing it, another person can. I used to work at Odyssey House, which is a drug rehab centre. We would go months and months without anyone self-harming. And then often once one person started doing it, another person would do it as well. So the contagion effect is a significant problem. The reason this happens is our brains are hardwired to be social. Um, our brains aren't really good at doing long, complex mathematical equations, but they are really good at being social and connecting with other people. We found that stress can be contagious. Um, this was a fascinating study. Um, a group of researchers, um, what they did was they put sweat pads under the arms of beginner skydivers. So you can imagine that's a really stressful event. Then they took the sweat pads, they put it in a nebulizer, and they got people that had been calm to inhale the sweat. Yes, psychological research is really glamorous, and um, I know what you're thinking. But the interesting thing was they got the people to in that had not been stressed to inhale this, and then they scanned their brains, and they couldn't actually tell the difference between the ones that had been genuinely stressed from skydiving and the ones that had just inhaled it. And this is an interesting study that shows just how contagious stress can be. And of course, we're living in a stressful world. You know, the latest um, lockdown in Auckland's caused a lot of stress. And so this can be contagious for people. Um, just a uh, side note, um, there's the work of Anne E. Becker. Um, she did some work in um, Fiji, and she found that um, things like eating disorders were almost unheard of, and Im um, body image problems were almost unheard of in Fiji. And then, I think in the early 90s, they started to get TV. And when they started to get TV, um, problems with body image increased. And it's thought, again, there can be a contagion effect. I know after an episode of Shortland Street that um, looked at self-harm, um, around the country, doctors and medical centres were reporting there'd been a staggering increase. So one way to overcome this is if we say everyone is self-harming and we have an epidemic of self-harm, that is likely to increase the number of young people doing this. Now, some of these statements can be said to, say, politicians or medical doctors, but it's not a good idea to say this to young people. Instead, a better way to frame this is a majority of people, and roughly two out of every three people, which is a majority, do not self-harm. So it's really important we try and give messages that the majority of people are not doing this, and that may be one way to reduce the contagion effect. So if you notice that a young person has self-harmed, how do you approach this? Well, it's really important to say something like, you are not in trouble, but I'm concerned. 
one of the things we have found is that the teenage brain tends to interpret the emotion of fear as the emotion of anger. What this means is that if a teenager comes to me and says, I've self-harmed, and as an adult, I'm really worried for them, I am really concerned for them, they may not interpret my emotion as that I'm worried for them, they may interpret that as I am angry at them. And if young people believe that you are angry at them, that will not um, help them get help. So as I said before, um, a really good statement is, you are not in trouble, but I'm really concerned for you. And if you state your emotion, say, I'm not concerned, so I'm not angry, but I am really concerned. If you state how you're feeling, that tends to help young people get this. So even if you're thinking, um, you know, I'm really calm, I'm really accepting of this, your face may, the young person may misread your face. So it is absolutely vital that you um, state your emotions. One of the questions that comes up again and again is should you tell their parents? Um, in most situations, this is probably a good idea, but you do have to be really careful. For example, if there is sexual abuse happening in the house from one of the parents, and that is the reason a young person is self-harming, if you tell the parents that, you could put that child in mortal jeopardy. So you do have to think very carefully about this. I believe an adult in the young person's life does need to know, in most cases it should be the parents, but um, we do have to be really careful with who we choose. So it's good to ask a young person and say, look, I've noticed this, I'm really concerned about you, um, I can't keep this to myself, we need to tell someone, could we tell your parents? And sometimes if they sort of think about it, I often say, would you like me to tell them? And sometimes the difficulty is telling them, but if they say, no, sometimes we do need to respect that because there could be good reasons why we don't want them to know. So in that case, maybe look at, um, is there a, say, aunt or uncle or a family friend that we could tell? One of the um, significant um, misunderstandings is around the Privacy Act in New Zealand. Many people think the Privacy Act says you can never reveal confidential information. Well, if you read rule number 11 of the Privacy Act, it says there are limits to the disclosure of information. What this means is that if you believe that someone is in danger of death or serious harm, you have an absolute right, and I would say obligation, to break their privacy. So if you think that um, a young person is self-harming in a way that you know, they don't know what they're doing, they could end their life, or you know, they're in real trouble, even if the young person says, I don't want anyone else to know about this, if you believe that someone is in danger of death or serious harm, you should break the confidentiality. Now, if you're not sure whether you should, um, you can always talk to a manager. Hopefully you've got a supervisor. Um, you can contact our Taihohi. I'm really happy if you want to contact me. Um, but it's really important to know what the Privacy Act does and does not say. I mean this quite literally when I say that some people misunderstanding the Privacy Act has killed people in New Zealand. Um, so hopefully you've all seen the um, Youth Worker Code of Ethics. Uh, this hasn't changed from the um, new addition to the code. Um, but one of the most important parts of the code is um, section number nine, know your limits. And it's really important that as a youth worker, you may be able to identify some of this but you need to pass it on to someone like a counselor, nurse or a doctor um, who can actually help with um, some of this stuff. As I said, some of this stuff can be caused by trauma. This is really complex. Unfortunately, around New Zealand, we have had examples of youth workers that have tried to manage this themselves. They have not um, got the young person professional help and it has ended very, very badly. So it's absolutely vital that you know your limits and you know the sort of things that you can manage and the sort of things that you cannot. So um, the world of help seeking can be really quite confusing. Um, often if you say Google something like a counsellor and say Christchurch or Auckland, a whole lot of results come up and it can be overwhelming for a lot of people. And a lot of people think, mm, this is too difficult, I don't know what to do. 
So I say, if it's all too confusing and overwhelming, you don't know what to do, get the young person to see a doctor. One of the advantages of going to see a doctor is um, everyone should have a doctor. Um, if not, you can find one fairly easily and you should be able to see a doctor within 24 hours where sometimes if you put a young person on a wait list to see a counsellor, it could be 10 to 12 weeks. And then a doctor should be able to make a quick assessment and work out what's going on. Interesting enough, I host a radio show on Plains FM and I've asked person after person with um, experience of mental illness, if you had one bit of advice for someone going through this, what would it be? And person after person has said, they wished they knew they could change doctors or counsellors. So in other words, if a helping professional um, says, oh, they're just self-harming to seek attention, ignore it. It's important to know you can change professionals. So as I said before, um, there's a part of the brain called Broca's area, the speech and language part of the brain. And that doesn't work so well if um, someone uh, has experienced trauma. And so yes, sometimes people can talk about this in counseling, but it's important to know there's lots of other therapies out there that can also be really effective. Um, so there's art therapy. This is done with a trained therapist, but basically a lot of people, they have these terrible thoughts and images in their heads, but they can't actually talk about it but maybe they could express what they're going through through a painting, through a sculpture. Some people even take a paintbrush and just um, throw paint around a page. Um, sometimes things like that can be really helpful. There is also drama therapy. Um, sometimes people grow up in a culture where they're told, you can't talk about your emotions. And maybe in drama therapy with a guided therapist, they could play a character that has depression. And this allows them to work through those emotions without initially maybe having to admit this is what they're going through. I'll talk about this one here. And um, this is called play therapy. This was developed for children. Um, and often children just find talking to a counselor quite difficult, but sometimes they can use toys or models to explain the situation. Sometimes people that have experienced significant trauma, they don't trust anyone. So there's a form of therapy called animal assisted therapy. And um, sometimes learning how to look after and care for, say, a dog or a horse, that can really help people to rebuild their trust. And then maybe after that, they could see a therapist. And then there's something called um, neurofeedback. This is where your brain is connected to an EGG machine, which reads your brain waves, and people get to see what their brain is doing on screen and respond to that. A lot of people with trauma say, I don't know what my body's doing. I don't understand these emotions. I don't know when I get angry. I just burst into tears for no reason. And if they can start to see well, what their brain is doing, sometimes that helps them to start to recognize, okay, so I'm feeling this emotion and this is how I need to respond to that. Probably one of the most important uh, ones is something called treatments is called EMDR or eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Your body actually has a natural way to deal with trauma and that is in a phase of sleep called REM. Um, you go through different phases of sleep at night and one of them is called rapid eye movement sleep. It's thought in that phase of sleep you can process all your traumatic memories and it can heal and soothe them. The problem is if people have PTSD, they wake up before they get to that critical phase of sleep. There's a form of therapy called EMDR, and it sounds like a slightly crazy therapy. It involves a therapist moving their finger in front of your face like that. And you might think, well, how on earth does that help? But we call rapid eye movement sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, because your eyes move rapidly at night. And so the theory is that there's something about doing this that tricks the brain into thinking it's in that critical stage of sleep. There are also methods of this for blind people that involve, say, touching different sides of your body. And this can even be used on children as young as two. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk believes that this is one of the most effective forms of treatment that he has ever tried with his patients. There are lots of therapists around New Zealand that are starting to offer this. So it's really important to be aware of this. One of the problems, say, if you take sexual abuse is many people blame themselves. Even if they were one or two at the time, sometimes 50 years later, they still say it was my fault. 
And person after person has said to them, no, it wasn't your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. But they seem to be stuck there. There is something about EMDR that seems to allow people to actually process these things. And after this, often people stop blaming themselves. So it's important to know how powerful this can be. So those are some therapies that are offered by um, professional counsellors and therapists. Um, if you want a simple technique that you can teach young people that can really help overcome some difficult um, emotions is something called expressive writing. This happens when you just take a pen and paper and just write down whatever's on your mind. So a lot of young people get really stressed with exams or friendships or things that aren't going well at school. This builds up in their head and the reason they self-harm is they want to stop this happening. Well, if you take a pen and paper and write down whatever's on your mind, whatever you're thinking about, that can often get these ideas out of your head and into something positive. And it doesn't matter whether you're good at spelling or not. Some people even use pictures. But the basic idea is that you get these things out of your head and into something positive. In the last year, I've heard that there are more and more, pri sorry, there are more and more primary school children that are self-harming. This is a significant problem. Many of the reasons that I've talked about apply to adults, so teenagers and adults, but when it comes to children, I believe there's another reason why they may self-harm. This is sensory processing problems. When most people hear a TV, and let's say you have a class of 30 people and you have the TV at a medium volume, most people will hear that at a medium volume. However, some people with sensory processing issues or problems, they can hear it as an extremely loud or an extremely quiet volume. This means that often they feel like they are being attacked by sound in their environment. This is a slightly older person, um, but someone came to me and said um, there was a 16 year old that was um, self-harming. She'd been suicidal for over a year. Um, she tried multiple medications, therapies, and nothing seemed to work. Someone asked about, um, does she have a sensitivity to noise? And she said, yes. So we got her some noise cancelling headphones. The parents stopped using the food processor and the vacuum cleaner around her. And then her suicidal thoughts and self-harm stopped. If you imagine that like little sounds attack you and um, cause you to be dysregulated, the world would not be a fun place to be in. So it's important that we raise awareness of this. It is also important to know that sensory processing issues do not just occur with sound, but they can occur with all the other senses. Um, for example, um, the sense of touch. Sometimes people find the inside seam of socks. It's like the sandpaper is grinding against them. So it's really important to know this is a growing problem. Now, a lot of us don't like loud noises, but it's important to know the difference between uncomfortable, like for most of us, if a balloon pops, we get a bit of a fright, but then we can relax quite easily. But if someone has sensory processing problems, that sends their nervous system into emergency mode, and that could last for, say, up to an hour, um, in some cases longer than that. Even relatively quiet sounds can do this to some people. So it's important to know that lots of us don't like, you know, balloons popping and things like that. But for some people, this actually triggers them and it causes significant problems. Uh, sorry, when someone is in this triggered state, they can't think clearly. Um, they won't be able to calmly, um, they won't be able to calm down. They won't be able to think about this. And I believe this is one of the key reasons why we have seen a significant increase in violence in young people around New Zealand. Um, schools um, are reporting both primary and secondary schools almost a 100% rise in violence in the last few years. Now, many people might ask, well, why are sensory processing problems becoming more and more common? Well, we certainly know that if people have a history of trauma, they do become sensitive to loud sounds, such as a soldier coming back from war, they often find the sounds of fireworks very distressing. But I also wonder whether maybe the modern world has made this problem worse. If we look at an old police car from the 1950s, they had mechanical lights and sirens that were quite slow. The lights would move around fairly slowly. Unfortunately, on modern police cars, they have incredibly fast, loud, flashing lights. And I believe many of the modern sounds in the modern world are dysregulating people. 
what does this mean for children and self-harm? Well, one of the key symptoms is head banging. Um, a lot of primary schools that I've talked to, they've seen an increase in children um, either banging their head on desks or on walls. This is not just gently tapping the desk, often they thump their head down with all their force. I believe the key reason they are doing this is they are overwhelmed. The noise in their environment has distressed them so much and they just want it to stop. I'm not talking about suicide today, but I also believe that this may be a reason why suicides are increasing. Um, we seem to have had a um, quite alarming rise in either suicide attempts or completed suicides by 12 to 14 year olds in New Zealand. Traditionally, that has been a very rare age group for those things. There's a very interesting researcher called Dr. Stephen Porges, and he came up with something called the polyvagal theory. Um, now, this is um, a little bit complicated, but basically you've got this um, nerve in your brain and it helps regulate your heart rate. And so when you're calm, your heart beats nice and steadily. But there's certain things that can trigger this. And one of the things he says that can trigger this are what we call predatory sounds. If you were in the jungle and you heard a low growl, that would tell you there could be a tiger there and that is dangerous. But unfortunately, a lot of modern devices such as air conditioners and heat pumps can replicate that low growl and it can dysregulate many people. I encourage every school that I work with, get rid of the high-pitched bell. For many students, as soon as they walk into school, the bell goes off, it triggers them, it dysregulates them, and they stay in the state for an hour until the next bell goes off. So there are some students that are dysregulated the entire day, and of course, you're in that state, you can't learn. So I encourage schools, maybe even use a hand bell, or um, try and use, say, um, bird sounds. Um, most schools have got a sound system built in, I really, really urge schools to replace the school bell. Um, noise cancelling headphones can be really helpful for this. And again, it just reduces a lot of those invasive sounds that can cause a lot of people to you know, bang their heads and self-harm. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about this if you want to email me. But um, a lot of schools are starting to install what's called sealed ear whisper. And um, particularly in the modern learning environment where they put three classrooms together, this reduces a lot of the background noise. And so particularly people with sensory processing problems, um, this just reduces a lot of those really loud, sharp sounds. Um, if you follow that link there, you can learn more about it. Um, it's really important to know that um, there are things you can do to minimize the noise within a school. And finally, Dr. Stephen Porges has developed something called the Safe and Sound Protocol. Um, what happens is people with sensitivities to noise, they can um, listen to this. It sounds like this weird alien sound, but what it does is it helps reset the nervous system. And often people, if people go through a week of this, um, they say they feel a lot calmer and they don't find loud noises so triggering. Um, there's lots of people around New Zealand that are starting to offer this. So if you do know a young person that has high sensitivity to noise, it's really important to look at this. Right, last couple of things I want to finish with and then we shall ask questions. One of the um, big problems that we have in the youth work space, in fact the charity space in the world, is what we call silos. This is where we don't talk to each other and often what happens is, um, say, a youth worker tries to manage this all themselves, or a doctor tries to manage this themselves, or a counsellor tries to manage this themselves, and they burn out. It's really tough having even one young person that's experiencing self-harm. It can be really distressing. What happens if you've got 10 or 15 people like this? And unfortunately, a lot of really good youth workers leave the profession because they burn out. Well, one of the key ways to overcome this is something called the multidisciplinary team. So instead of expecting one professional to manage this on their own, try and get, say, you know, a doctor, maybe a social worker, a youth worker, maybe a teacher, try and get them all into one room or on a Zoom call and just discuss what can you actually do. And instead of one person um, that's high needs being supported by one person, we now have a team of people around this person um, often uh, they get much better care because you bring in the expertise of different fields. 
So sometimes youth workers tend to stick to themselves, but it's really important that we try and make good links with social work organisations, try and make good work um, links with doctors and some of these other situations. So I really encourage you, try and get to know the different services in your area. Um, if you want to know how much help is out there, there's something called the Family Services Directory. This has a complete list of all the help and support agencies throughout New Zealand. It's estimated there's about 5,000 nationwide. And I really encourage you to spend some time on here and just look at the services in your area, maybe ring them up and say, look, would anyone like to have a coffee? Or maybe like four or five services could get together um, and just, you know, learn about what you do so that if you have a young person in need, you may, okay, there's a, you know, I know this person over here, I can refer them to them. Sometimes we try and do this all in ourselves or by ourselves. And when we do that, we burn out, we get stressed. We find we're awake at two or three in the morning thinking, is this young person okay? Have I made the right decision? In Christchurch, what we're trying to do is, um, run an event say on a Wednesday morning where we invite a whole lot of different social services from all sorts of different backgrounds together you get two minutes to talk about what you do and the idea of that is to try and enhance networking and connection so really that's the most important thing that we can do to ultimately help some of these people. Uh, the Collaborative has an upcoming webinar on de-escalation, how to deal with um, angry and aggressive young people. If you follow this link here, collaborative.org.nz, what's on, um, you can find out about that. I think that's uh, next Thursday. So we're seeing a lot of young people around New Zealand that are showing signs of violence. Uh, if you want to know how to effectively manage that, um, please come to that webinar. And lastly, um, if you do want to contact me, there's my email address. Really happy if you want to contact me, if you want more information about anything that I've talked about today, if you want the PowerPoints, um, and if you're on LinkedIn, if you want to add me on there. Um, also, I'm running a series of workshops in Southland, in uh, Omaru, Dunedin, uh, Alexander, and um, in Bicargo. So if you'd like more information about those ones, um, please email me about that. Um, those ones are at the start of March. Right, do we have any questions? And Shannon, are you there? I am here. Right. <laughs> yeah, let's, um, let's see if any peeps want to hop into the chat. Any other questions? I noticed that there's a number 10, oh, there's a Cromwell Youth Trust, Kaimahi. Yeah, from Fran. Yeah, so yeah, if you, cool. yeah. if Fran wants to, um, I can send you the details of those workshops that are coming up. Namihi nui kia koe. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, before the presentation started about how there is that uh, increasing need um, for the wider community to be asking about these sorts of trainings. And so I'm really grateful that you've gifted your presentation to these involved webinar series. Um, and I really like that reminder about us educating ourselves on trauma and trauma-informed care. I think that's really, mm -hmm. really useful. Thank you again, Michael. Uh, I'm just going to mm -hmm. close off with karakia and then uh, we'll let everyone get on with their day. So, ka i noi tato, kia whakairia te tapu, kia wātia ai te ara, kia tūruki whakataha ai, kia tūruki whakataha ai. Homie huie tai kie. Thanks so much, Michael. I really, really appreciated your time, and I'm sure a lot of peeps did here. Um, yeah, cheers. My, my pleasure.